The next episode of Painting and Travel takes us to the Vanderhorst Plantation on Kiowa Island, South Carolina. Sarah tours the mansion, while Roger shares some thoughts and techniques about landscape painting with his students. Today, Sarah and I are in Kiowa, South Carolina. It's a beautiful island, and right behind me, there's an incredible plantation that's beautifully restored. We're going to see a little bit of that later. But right now, I'm going to paint this driveway that comes into the plantation. It's sort of in deep woods. It's sort of a difficult subject to paint, but uh, the group was painting this yesterday, and some questions came up, so I thought I would do a demonstration of it this morning. I'm using an 11 by 14 inch piece of masonite to paint on and this is covered with gesso and I have a tone of burnt sienna on here. The reason I put the burnt sienna on it just gets rid of all that white. I don't have to deal with white when I paint the picture here. And also a lot of this burnt sienna can glow through the painting. I have a small selection of brushes with me today. I have a couple of flat brushes, a three-quarter inch flat brush, small pointed brush, and a fan brush, which might come in handy for these trees back here. Well, let me get started. My palette consists of titanium white, naphthol red, ultramarine blue, and Indian yellow. And I may add some cadmium yellow light to that a little bit later on to make some bright, vivid greens. Picking up primarily my blue and my yellow here and I'm toning the board. I'm going to keep this warm to begin with. I've got my atomizer here. This helps keep my paints wet a little bit, but it helps primarily to let my paint flow over my board very easily as I paint. The uh, paint won't drag at all if this is a little bit damp. Now, even though I've toned this board once, this is such a dark scene back here. I'm actually gonna tone it a second time. It's never good to divide the canvas in half, but in this case, I think I am going to have the road end pretty much in the middle of the painting. It's so enveloped by everything else here. I don't think it's going to be a problem to have that end back there. The road's going to end about here, but I think the vanishing point will be up here, so it will be a little bit above the center of the painting. There's very little drawing to do in a painting like this. And one huge problem when painting what I call this deep wood scene is that nothing is defined. Um, for instance, when I look out there and I see some palmettos and palms, I can't really distinguish what they are because everything around them is the same color and the same value. So what I need to do is try and pick out one or two items to define this scene. Now if we, for instance, go out in back of the plantation here and look at a palm tree against the, the blue sky, we can see exactly what the shape of the palm tree is. Now it's important because to define an object, you need to look at the edge of the form. That's what describes an object. That's why silhouettes work. The inside of the silhouette can be all black, but you can tell it's a silhouette of a face or something by the edge of the form. Same way with all this foliage out here. Now the palm tree out back against the sky, we can see what that is because it's silhouetted against the sky. But looking out here, nothing is silhouetted. Everything is blended together. So we don't have any really good description of any one particular item out here, with the exception of maybe a tree trunk or two. And that's what makes this type of painting uh, a bit of a challenge. Well, as you can see, this is dry already, and we've only been out here one or two minutes. I will pick up some of the, my green colors with the Indian yellow and ultramarine blue, and we'll just start 
working some of these green colors into this area. And what, I, what my intention here is, is to just start getting some good texture and some good color, good rich dark colors on here. And I always start with my darks and I work towards my lights. And if you're doing watercolors, of course, you have to do the exact opposite. A lot of this rough brushwork, I can leave it just as it is. And hopefully I'll be able to define one or two items in here, which will help to describe the rest of the scene. I'm not really working from background to foreground. I'm just working from dark to light. Now this path looks very warm to me, so I'm, I'm putting, I'm warming it up some. Well, I think maybe I will uh, add some of the tree trunks now. And they are very warm, so I'll take my red and my blue, make this dark purplish color. I'm trying to be careful when I place these tree trunks not to get a trunk that looks very graceful and snake-like. I don't want nice, short curves. Wherever a branch comes off, there's sort of an elbow, and I want to accentuate that a, a bit to make the, uh, the tree a little, a little bit more crooked than maybe it actually is. But I don't want nice, flowing, graceful lines down here. I'm not trying to be very accurate as far as the actual shape of this tree, because I'm not doing a, a portrait of the tree. I'm just trying to give the appearance of somewhat of what it looks like here. This is a very, this is very much a perspective issue here with these trees, and I don't think the trees are planted necessarily uh, equal distance apart, but as they go back, they certainly do appear to look closer and closer all the time. When I'm placing these trees in here, what I'm doing is I'm kind of giving myself a bit of a road map as for the negative areas that I can put in around these trees. And I don't want to make all these limbs uh, attached to each trunk because some of these limbs, I can see them and then they're covered with moss. I don't see them and then they appear again. So I want to give a lost and found effect with these limbs. Here you can see this goes up here and then we can't see it. Maybe there'll be some moss or some foliage here. If I were to paint the limbs all connecting without having these broken spaces, it would look like a dead tree. I have painted a number of these deep woods scenes. Here are a couple of them I can show you right now. And sometimes they come off very quickly and other times I, they're a bit of a struggle. Roger, if you were doing a portrait of a tree, yes. would you break up the limbs also? Would you separate them as well? I think I, I, I would, yes. I, you know, it's not like doing a portrait of a, a personality, a face, because primarily what I want to achieve here is a, is a, good, is a good composition and a good painting. Like I said, if, if all these limbs are attached, then it ends up looking like a dead tree. Now, of course, I can put uh, foliage over the top of these, which I will do too. But right now, this is just kind of a road map as to where I think I might want to go. Now, here on the uh, shadow of a tree, this is a very dark color. It's primarily uh, blue and red, but I have a touch of yellow in there. It's just about as dark as I can get with these three colors. Now the shadow of the tree, I want that to be the same color as the trunk of the tree. If I have it any other way, it might look like that tree is sitting on top of the ground with an extra shadow beside it. So I generally take the same color I'm using for the trunk of the tree and I start to drag it to the side. Now this path coming in here, it's fairly flat, but I want to accentuate the look of it a bit and maybe make it look like there's some a few ruts in the road. And I can do that with the shadow. So here, here would be one tire track of ruts here, and here would be another tire, tire track of ruts here. So what I, what I can do is take this shadow where the tire tracks are, it sort of bends down, comes back up, bends back down again where the second tire of any vehicle would be. 
So are you using any kind of um, extender with your um, acrylic paint, or are you just using the occasional spray of water to keep your paint alive? I have used extenders in the past, but I find that for the most part, just working with the paint uh, suits me the best. If I start working with too many other extenders and dryers and such on, it just um, uh, sort of confuses my my concentration on the painting. So uh, I know uh, many people do use them and like them. Personally, I don't find as much use for them as, as some people do. But this uh, sprayer is very important to have. I mean, this is, this is so dry right now, and this is one of the advantages of using acrylics uh, because I won't get my colors muddy here. I mean, they're, they're pretty muddy the way they are right now, but that's the way I want them to start with. Uh, but I can put vivid colors over this and they won't mix into these, of course, colors because these are dry. So that's one advantage of using acrylics. One disadvantage is they just don't feel quite as nice. You know, you don't get that nice buttery feeling when you paint. There, I can see a little bit of a pattern evolving now with this. I'm going to continue to keep it dark. There's a nice feature down at the very end of the drive with a gate. And I think I will try and feature that. It's right here. And it is not lit. The sun is not on it. But I think later on I may try and put some patches of sunlight on that to bring the eye back there. I'm going to have to push the values on this scene because the light even though it's fairly bright today, it's not hitting the trunks of these trees very much. Uh, so I'm going to have to just sort of look carefully down there and accentuate the highlights on these trees. Otherwise, my painting is just going to be too dark. I think I'll keep my brightest colors to be right, or my uh, lightest lights to be right here at the end of the road to bring my eye where I want that to be. This is a beautiful lawn here. I think I will put some of that in. Whatever is closest to me will be, will have the most contrast and can have the most color. And here it's very obvious. So far I haven't used hardly any white. I used a little bit of white in here, but in these greens I'm not using any white, not yet. I want the edge of this road to be very soft. I don't want it to look like it's a paved road. I want it to look like it's got the leaves on it, which it does. I'm holding off on those highlights. The pillars back there from the front gate are very dark, and I have them very dark right here. So the question is, how do I, how do I accentuate those? Well, I could make the post light, but they're dark brick, so we'll leave those dark, but we can bring those forward, bring the eye there by mixing up a contrasting color and putting it beside him. So what do you do with a painting like this, Roger, when the light begins to change and you've already placed areas of light there? Do you work on memory or do you still honor those places or how do you move forward? If the light gets really much better than it has been when we started, I'll try and grab that. I don't um, have one vision to begin with and try and stay with that. I really have to work with it as it changes. Now, I know there's two different, you know, schools of thought on that. One is that you, you have a, a particular goal in mind and you try and stay with it. But I, I, if it changes and I think I can improve my painting by what happens with the light, then I go ahead and I, I try and do that. Do you ever take a photo and go back and work from that? I mean, pick your favorite one? Or? Oh, I always take a photograph, yes. There, you can see how this is starting to define these posts. Now I can accentuate the trunks of these trees in the same way by just putting some lighter values and colors beside these tree trunks. Now the shadows on this road, it's all pretty much warm in color, but the highlights are much warmer than the shadow parts. So I'm not going to make a lot of blue shadows in here because there's so much 
of the local color showing with the leaves and all that I'm going to keep this all warm. I'm not going to put, put in a lot of blue shadows. I'll may, maybe put in a couple of them, but not very many. And I'll drop in a few of these sunny highlights across the road. Here we can show where that dips down, comes back up, falls back down again, so we can express those little ruts in the road. Now as it comes forward here a little bit more, these highlights can be a little more uh, color in them. So I'll make them at least a little more yellow out here than I will back there. Although right back here, I think I'll really push it and make it very light. So right here, I can add this road and really define those posts even more. Now I don't see the road because it's so thick with vegetation here, but I would like to see the road more. So in some of these areas between the trees, I'm going to show a little bit more of the road just by putting in these highlights. And I can put these all the way along here and that will show that road back there. It'll look like this is thinned out just a bit. Will you even be concerned about the, um, the gate? I, I will, but I think I'll leave that towards oh, the yeah, last. Towards the end. Yeah. Maybe even put that in in the studio. Uh, I could put it in now because this is dry. Uh -huh. I think maybe I'll leave some of the small details for the studio and try and get as clean as much as I can from the real thing here. Because when I take a photograph of this, all these tree trunks are basically going to be black in my picture. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to see the color in the photograph that I can see in real life. So I want to get as much of that information down here or try and remember it as much by observing it now. And then I'll worry about some of those small things back in the studio. Now if I have a patch of sunlight here on the road in the foreground, it should be quite light. Drag a bit of that over into the grass. But it would stand to reason the grass in here would be a brighter green. So we'll take some yellow and blue and we'll follow that highlight on the road over into the grass. Same way here, we've got this highlight coming right here in the road. I think I'll just take that, follow that right across. Here we have another patch of sunlight right on the road. We'll take a little bit of the green, drag it back there. So now all these dark colors are, are not quite so oppressive. It's starting to starting to perk up with a little bit of color and some life. On the edge of these trees, I'm going to put some of this bright sunlight, a few more patches of it. So we'll take a, kind of an orange color here with a bit of white in it, and we'll put a few more highlights over these tree trunks. Towards the top of the trees, I'm seeing some of the sky come through. And since I have this network of limbs here already established, I can use those as a, uh, a roadway to where to put my negative areas in between them. And when I add the sky, I try and uh, express the limbs and the branches. I'm not really painting the sky, I'm sculpting the sky to expose the limbs and the branches. The sky holes always need to be rounded just a bit. Even though a tree trunk may have uh, you know, the limbs that they branch out in a sharp V section here. In that V section, I don't make a very, a real sharp corner. I always round it off a bit everywhere I go. So every, all these shapes are a bit rounded on the edge. And that makes it look like the light's coming through because as the light is coming through these trees, the light sort of bends around the limbs and the branches a bit. So it's sort of light, it, it sort of, lights the edge of the limb and the branch. I think with the big brush again, I'll, I'll apply some more foliage because this is still very dark and I want it to remain very dark, but not to where it's really depressing looking. Roger, when do you think you're done with the painting? How do you know you're ready to stop? Usually I stop in a painting when I don't know what else to do with it. <laughs> when I get to the point where I think 
the more, if I put another stroke on it, it's going to start to get worse rather than better. I stop. And often I know the painting can be better, but may, I just don't have the ability or the skill. And so at that point, I try and know when to stop. Now out in the field, it's always a little different because at some point out in the field, I have to leave nature behind. I have to take it in the studio and I have to sort of forget about nature. I have to concentrate on this for the color and the composition and forget about what I'm looking at. And I'm about at that point right now. So I think this may be a good time to uh, get some photographs and we'll go back into the studio, put a few finishing touches on this. Take a look at this beautiful avenue of live oaks. They are gorgeous and they're old and the limbs are so huge that they practically touch overhead and it makes a lovely tunnel which gently ushers you to this beautiful mansion. And the mansion is owned by Beth Darby Hazlip and her family. Beth, I know you and your family have done lots of renovations and I'm wondering um, who owned the house originally? Um, the Vanderhorst family from Holland um, owned the um, plantation. It was the second home that was actually built in Kiowa. And um, this is actually the back of the house. The entrance is on the river because it was an indigo um, and cotton plantation. Mm -hmm. The house was abandoned in 1930 and sat for almost 100 years. Well, I visited the island about 30 years ago and I remember riding a bike down here and someone said, oh, that's the old plantation house. And it was very dilapidated. My husband and I went up there and looked at the house. I just thought it would fall apart. Beth, let's take a look inside so you can show us some of the lovely details and the finished product. Beth, I was wondering, since this house is so old, did you find any Civil War artifacts? Actually, there is. There's some graffiti that was left on the wall. They would hide here during the Civil War. It was right here, and it's been preserved. And what did it say? Did it have a general's name on it? Beth, I want to see some more of this house. Let's uh, go up to the second floor. This is a narrow stairway. Very deep and short. Has a nice feel to it though. It's been walked up a few million times, I'm sure. Yeah, this is all original floors. Oh, Beth, this is lovely. I feel as if I've stepped back in time about 100 years or so. And the period furniture is gorgeous. Did you have trouble finding it? Did you use a decorator? Um, we definitely use a designer and she helped find the furniture. I mean, everything had to be furnished. And also my sister lives here and she's helped a lot. Yes, well, I was reading about the house and some of the information you gave me and I realized that uh, it, from time to time, dreadful things have happened here. Well, the plantation was sold in 1930 to a lumber company and they actually would store wood in here and, and grow wood and sell it. And um, then it was abandoned for almost 100 years before we renovated it. Beth, it's been so much fun to be here and spend some time at this lovely plantation. I know Roger has really enjoyed the workshop. Oh, Roger was excellent. He's been one of our best teachers. Um, I've been doing this for 16 years. My sister and I decided when we got this plantation, which can sleep, you know, 20 to 25 people, that we would have um, an art week. And um, this is one of the best that we've had. Well, that's good to hear. And I have seen some nice paintings that you and your fellow artists have turned out of the driveway and of the marsh and other lovely views around here. Well, we're back here in the studio and ready to finish this painting. Kind of limited on time here, so I'm going to go through this rather quickly. I've added two more colors to my palette cadmium yellow light and chromium oxide green. I think this area all in here, I think there's too much burnt sienna, too much warm colors showing through here, so I'm going to put some more greens in there. This ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow light will make a nice rich cool green. If I were to mix it with the Indian yellow it would make a very warm green. It's a very dark green up in these trees. Very little light coming through. They were pretty dense. Right in this area here, just to push that way in the background, I'm going to make this very blue back in there. This contrast between the dark and light will also help these posts to be a little more prominent. With some warm reddish tones, I'm going to lighten this road. The entire painting just seems too dark, so I need to lighten a lot of these areas. 
Well, I've lightened up this road quite a bit, put in some more highlights and accents right down in here. Then I've taken some blue colors and I've added them right back in here. Just sort of adds a bit of vibrancy to the painting. I've also lightened this area here more, so when I put the fence post in, they'll show up nicely. I've put out some cadmium red light on my palette, and I'm mixing a warm color to make some of the Spanish moss. This Spanish moss sort of breaks up this big dark area. I think it's time to finish this painting now by putting this fence right in here. I could make it either light or dark, but I think I'm going to try and make it dark. It may stand out a little bit more that way. I'm going to mix up some dark green and put a hint of a hedge on each side here. That way the gate makes more sense. With a light color, I'll just put a few accents on here. Well, it's a good thing I started this painting out in the field, and although I didn't get that far with it out there, I was able to see the colors firsthand. The photograph I'm working with here, the colors are all just gone. So I was able to remember and use some of those colors in this painting here. Well, I think that should finish this painting. So now let's take one last final look. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.